Welcome again. In our readings, we are at John chapter 6, verses 25 through 59. Jesus, the bread of life. And I, this, is, this is going to be awesome because there's lots of good spiritual nuggets of gold here that we're going to be extracting. Okay, so let's get right into it. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, let's take this in context now. If, if you followed me in the past several sessions, you will know that, you know, Jesus, we talked about Jesus feeding the thousands, you know, miraculously. We talked about Jesus walking on the water and how the, his disciples, just before Jesus came walking on the water, his disciples got into a boat by themselves without Jesus and rode out into the sea and a great storm hit the sea and they rode out like four, three, four miles, five, six kilometers and uh, a very vicious sea. In the midst of that storm, Jesus came walking on the water and they were afraid. Jesus said, I am proclaiming himself to be uh, the same person that Moses was talking to in the burning bush. And when Moses said, who am I, who am I talking to? You know, what did, what did the uh, God of the burning bush say? I am that I am. Go tell them that I am has sent, has sent you. So um, Jesus proclaimed himself to be the great I am. He got into the boat and immediately he was on the other side of the sea. The people therefore came and were what, like, they were like, wait a second. We saw the disciples get into the boat alone. Jesus stood, stayed behind. Now, how did you get over here, Jesus? You didn't, I don't see another boat. I don't see another boat. How did you get over to the other side of the sea? We don't understand how this happened. So that's why it says here, you know, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Like, how did you get here? What happened? Let's go on. Verse 26, Jesus answered them, Most certainly I tell you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food which perishes, but for the food which remains to eternal life, which the Son of Man, Ben Adam, that's speaking of the Messiah, will give to you, for God the Father has sealed him. Now, once again, look at Jesus' strategy here. He performed a great miracle here, feeding thousands of people with what Jesus would call, you know, the food that perishes, okay? He fed them with natural earthly bread, you know, miraculously multiplied the bread uh, to thousands of people. And then he said, after they were all filled and they came and they found him again, and he said, okay, look at, look at, don't work for the food that, that perishes, but work for the food that is to eternal life, that remains to eternal life. Don't work for the temporary, work for the eternal. Work for the eternal. And that's what we're doing right here, actually, and that's what you're doing, hopefully, uh, in listening to these teachings, is you are soaking in and you are taking of the eternal food. You know, this is awesome. You know, Jesus said to Peter, if you love me, go feed my sheep. Feed them with the eternal food. So this is what we're, we're partaking of right here, aren't we? It's like we're at a banquet table and we are eating of the eternal food. So let's read on. Verse 28. They said therefore to him, What must we do that we may work the works of God? Then Jesus answered them, said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now, understand here once more, the whole context of this, because a lot of people take this out of context. They say, well, all we got to do is just believe. If you read the other parts of Scripture, especially even in this book alone, the book of John, the same author, you know, the same book, okay? If you read it in context, that it's, it's a whole lot more than just a mental ascension to, to something that you believe is true. It's, actu it's an actual lifestyle. When you believe in something, you do it. You live it out, Okay. Again, like I said before, many times, if you have disciples of a rabbi, if the disciples believe in a rabbi, 
it means they obey the rabbi. You got to obey it. Now think also of what Jesus said when he was talking to the to the Jewish people, saying, "You search the scriptures, thinking that in them you have eternal life, but they speak of me." Okay, so he says. You, he went on to actually say, uh, "You do not believe in me, but you." You claim to believe in the scriptures. You claim to believe in Moses, but you don't believe me. You don't believe in me. So he was saying it's impossible for you to 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 believe in Moses without obey without believing in me because Moses speaks about me and everything Moses wrote was about me. Moses knew me, and and the scriptures all speak of me. What Moses says is speaking of me. So I. And Moses are one, so to speak. They are alike. You know, Moses said that um, there will be a prophet that comes to you like me, said Moses, like me and him you shall hear. Speaking about Jesus coming, okay? That was the prophecy of, of the coming of Jesus by Moses himself, saying that Jesus would be like him. And a lot of Christians look at it the opposite way. They think that Moses is, you know, the law and Jesus is grace. No, no, no. They're all grace. God's grace was to show his beloved people the way to eternal life, the way to live, the guidelines and instructions for them to live. It was God's grace to give us Jesus. Yes, but it's also Jesus who is substantiated the law of Moses by telling the people, everything Moses wrote is about me. Everything I'm about is about Moses. It's the same thing, okay? You can't say you believe in Moses and not believe in me. Therefore, in that context, to believe in Jesus is to believe in the Torah because Jesus is the word manifest in the flesh. Jesus is the living, walking, personified Torah of Moses. Okay, If the Jesus you know of is not the same kind of person that the Torah would depict. In other words, if the Torah seems to be not compatible with the way you think Jesus is. And guess what? Your Jesus is a false Jesus. That's just the way it is. That's just the facts, okay? If you believe in Jesus, you believe in Moses. If you believe in Jesus, you believe in the scriptures. If you believe in Jesus, you believe in the word of God as pre-birth of Jesus because Jesus is the word manifest in the flesh. What's the word? Everything you read in the Old Testament at least everything that God said in the Old Testament is the Word, including all of the Torah. At least everything that God said, this is what, you know, thus saith the Lord. That's the Word of God. That's what God said. And what God speaks is Jesus. To believe in that is to believe in everything. You, you, you believe in the whole thing, okay? You don't, you don't pick and choose. You don't cherry pick you believe in everything. So Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. That means a whole lot more than just believing it up here in your head. A whole lot more than just information in your brain. A whole lot more. Verse 30. They said therefore to him, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you do? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Okay. Jesus said to them, most certainly I tell you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread out of heaven, but my father gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said therefore to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Notice there's a little bit of a change in their, in the way they talk there. A little bit of a change in the tone of the of these people talking to Jesus now. They went from kind of challenging him to saying more or less, "Okay, we need what you're talking about here. We need some of that, Jesus. Give, give us some of that, Jesus." Jesus said to them, "I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty." But I told you that you have seen me, and yet you don't believe. All those whom the Father gives me will come to me. He who comes to me, I will in no way throw out. Now, I'm going to stop right here because I know this scripture also is cherry-picked way too much in Christian circles. 
a lot of people say, well, once saved, always saved. You know, once you come to Jesus, Jesus will never cast you out. Well, not always. You look at, uh, you know, many times in the scriptures, you know, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23 makes it very clear. Jesus will cast out a lot of people that come to him. It says he, they, they will come to him. They will profess him as Lord. They will do great and mighty works and great mighty signs and prophesy and cast out demons, all kinds of things in his name. And because they have not yet repented, because they are not born again, because they are still unregenerate sinners, Jesus said, I will turn to them and I will say to them, depart from me, you who work iniquity into eternal fire. Okay, in the, in the context, that's what he's talking about. Many times Jesus said people will come to him and he will he will lock them out. Look at the look at the uh, the parable of the ten virgins. Okay, half of them got locked out. Okay, look at the look at the uh, sheep and the goats. You know, again Matthew chapter seven verses twenty one to twenty three. You read that? Yes, there will be there will be lots of people. Jesus said many will come to me. Yet I will say, depart from me. So you need to understand the context of this, okay? So for, one, so for one thing, yes, Jesus will not throw out those whom have really been, you know, uh, regenerated, uh, those who are really born again, those who are, have really repented, those who are really right with him, okay? If you're not right with him, if you are a worker of iniquity, if you do have sin in your life, Wow. I mean, I, uh, I challenge you. Read Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23 over and over and over again and do your best to repent if you can, okay? That's all I can say. I mean, hey, Jesus did promise us he will cast out many who comes to him. And once again, also, another, point, another, another uh, view of this or another uh, way of looking at this too, Jesus never said you can't walk away from him, Okay. He, he said here in this specific context and in the context of all of Scripture, if you're right with God, if, you, if you're really there with God, okay, you're born again, you're repented, you're a brand new creation, you're, 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 you're righteous, you are holy, you come to Him, He won't cast you out. Of course not. However, that's not to say that you can't turn your back on Him and walk away. He didn't say that. If you turn your back on Him and walk, walk away, yes, don't expect yourself to be in the hands of Jesus. And just, you're not going to be in the hands of Jesus if you walk out of the hands of Jesus by what you do, by what you say, by your lifestyle. Okay? Be careful. Fear God. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of my Father who sent me, that all he has given to me, I should lose nothing, but should raise him up at the last day. This is the will of the one who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, don't forget, this is the same author of John 3.36, where it says, you know, uh, those who disbelieve or those who disobey, the wrath of God lives on that person. The wrath of God remains on that person. So once again, don't cherry pick. Don't because some of these some people they're so narrow minded. They're so tunnel visioned. They can only see a few verses here, a few verses there, a few verses there. No, see it all. Look at it all. Take it all in context. Okay. Don't just take this and, and, and make it what, it what you like it to say, okay? Don't do that. Uh, so many people have done that. Don't do that. Take it all in context. Take the whole scope of Scripture from beginning to end. Verse 41, The Jews therefore murmured concerning him because he said, I am the bread which came down out of heaven. They said, Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know? How does he say, I have come down out of heaven? Therefore, Jesus answered them, Don't murmur among yourselves. No one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Again here, 
this is uh, this is very important to understand. No one can come to me except the Father draws him, Jesus said. So it's more than just preaching the gospel. It's more than just trying to get people saved. That person needs to be someone who has, who has been chosen of God, who has uh, been chosen to be the one who is drawn to Jesus. Okay, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except the Father draws him, which obviously implies there are people whom the Father does not draw. I mean, this is just, you know, one plus one equals two. This is, this is obvious here. There are people that the Father does not draw to Jesus. There are people whom the Father does draw to Jesus. When you go out there preaching, you need to preach. You need to be fishing for the fish that are the ones who are chosen. You need to be fishing for the ones whom the Father is drawing. Okay, that's the, that's the key. It is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. That's Isaiah 54 verse 13. Therefore, everyone who hears from the Father and has learned comes to me. Once again, I want to be very careful here by the term comes to me, comes to Jesus, because a lot of people, vast amount of people out there think that they've come to Jesus, but they didn't. They, they came to a preacher. They came to a, a meeting. They came to the, an idea of, what, of who they think Jesus is. They came to their own imagination of Jesus. They didn't come really to Jesus, okay? We need to find out the truth, okay? And the truth is not always pretty, even in this situation. Jesus is not always this, you know, loving kind of, you know, hyper nice kind of extra loving guy who just goes around just be, you know, just being so nice to everybody, you know, kissing the flowers and hugging the trees, you know, with a flower in his, in, behind his ear or something like that. That's not the way it describes him. It's not the way the, the scriptures d describe Jesus. That's not the true Jesus. The true Jesus is somebody who made a lot of people very angry. The true Jesus is one who said in John verse, uh, John chapter 7, verse 7, that the world hates him. Why does the world hate him? Why, why would Jesus say, the world hates me? If Jesus is such a loving guy as so many people pro portray him to be, such a wonderful, loving guy who's just blessing everybody, just loving everybody, why would Jesus say, the world hates me? Well, it says that right there in the very verse of John 7, 7. He said, the world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. So Jesus went around testifying that a lot of people's deeds were evil, and they hated him for it. And same today, if you are going to be like Jesus, if you're going to be preaching like Jesus, you're going to have to testify that a lot of people's deeds are evil. You know, stop this, you know, shaking everybody's hand that comes in the door of the church. I mean, stop it. I mean, it's time that pastors and preachers get up there behind the pulpits and do some good, wholesome, old-fashioned rebuking, you know. <laughs> and I know a lot of you are probably saying, yeah, amen, because... You know, some of you are in churches where you say, I know a lot of people that need to be rebuked. But you know what? Your pastor needs to rebuke that those people. Your priest needs to rebuke those people. Okay? First of all, your pastor needs to be right himself. There's a lot of pastors I, I have uh, uh, spoken to, and they're bound up in sin themselves. They're on their way to hell themselves. Okay? I don't care how much they preach the gospel from the pulpit. They're on their way to hell, to hell themselves. They're bound in sin. Well, I'm not perfect. You know, that's totally beside the point. That's totally what the gospel is not all about. Jesus never said to anybody, well, you're not perfect, so just believe. Do your best to believe. No, it's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus said, you know, and by the way, I'm not, I know a lot of people are going, oh, you're a perfectionist. Wait, wait a second now. By the way. Perfection in the eyes of God is a whole lot different than perfection in the eyes of men. Okay, so once again, we have to define the word perfection. How is perfection to be defined? In God's sight, perfection is obeying all of his laws that you are able to obey. Okay, because there's some that you are not able to obey. God doesn't, how can God expect you to obey the laws that you're not able to obey? Okay. 
So the ones that you are able to obey, yes, obey them. That's perfection. You can write a letter, you can write an email, you can, you can write a text, and you can make a spelling mistake. That's imperfection. Yeah, it is imperfection. You're not a perfect person in the eyes of men, in the eyes of the world. But that is not a sin in God's sight. Nowhere does it say in the Torah, thou shalt not make a spelling mistake. Nowhere does it say that. Okay? So making a spelling mistake doesn't make you imperfect in the eyes of God. You understand? There's a big difference between perfection in the eyes of God and perfection in the eyes of men. Put it this way. The Jews tell us that there are 613 laws in the Torah. And you know, a vast number of those laws are not for everybody. A lot of them are for the priests. A lot of them, you know, some of them are for women. Some of them are for children. Some of them are for men. Some of them are for strangers in the land. I mean, so there's a lot less than 316 laws that you are to obey. A lot less. Okay. But men's laws. Now, I, the last I've heard um, in, in, in uh, for example, in America alone, in the USA alone, uh, Lawyers don't even know how many laws there are. They can't even count. In lost count, they say they estimate at least four million. Four million laws. And yet you ask a Christian, are you a law-abiding citizen? Oh yeah, I'm a law-abiding citizen. Most Christians would tell you, especially professing Christians or people who profess to be practicing Christians would say, oh yeah, I'm law-abiding. So wait a second now, you, you claim to abide by four over 4 million laws, but yet you have a trouble with less than 613 of God's laws? Something is wrong here. Straining on a gnat and swallowing a camel. Uh, do I smell a little bit of hypocrisy, you know, shall, I, shall I say? So, um, so yes, uh, there's a big difference between perfection in the eyes of men and perfection in the eyes of God. Verse 46, not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most certainly I tell you that he who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Yes, the bread which I give him for the life of the world is my flesh. Verse 52. The Jews therefore contended with one another saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? I can just, I can just understand what they were saying. I can just understand their thoughts right now. These are Jews, remember. These are Jews that are Torah-abiding Jews. Remember in the, in, the, in the Torah, specifically and explicitly says not to eat the flesh of any another human being, okay? So these Jews are right now, they're fur standing on end, okay? They're fur standing on end. How can we eat? How can we eat his flesh? How dare he say that we are supposed to eat his flesh? What is this, cannibalism? What kind of cult is this? Okay? Verse 53, Jesus said to them, Most certainly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Woo! Jesus is going a little bit further there than just saying eating the flesh. He's also saying drinking blood, which is explicitly forbidden in the Torah. You shall not drink any blood from any, any creature at all. Blood is completely forbidden. Okay? So Jesus said, most certainly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you don't have life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as our fathers ate the manna and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Can you imagine the response, what these people are thinking? They are com completely, they're probably completely appalled. 
saying, how can this rabbi, how can this Jew, how can this person in the synagogue tell us to be a cannibal, not only to eat his flesh, but also to drink his blood, something that's explicitly forbidden by God? Okay. Once again, this is a great example of how someone can take the words of Jesus out of context, misinterpret it, take it out of context to think that it means something that it really doesn't. And that is what a lot of Christians do today, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, so to speak. They, they take a lot of what Jesus said that they think is so pretty and nice and so loving and preaches love and loving all this, and they try to make it, they, they misinterpret it. They, they take it out of context from the, the original context of what the scriptures actually say about whether or not God loves everybody, but whether or not God, you know, Jesus actually loves everybody. I know a lot of you are probably thinking, what are you getting at? What are you getting at? You know, check out my other teachings. You know, as it says in the book of Proverbs, okay, before you completely turn me off here, he who answers a matter before he hears it to him it is foolishness. It is a folly. So don't draw conclusions about, uh, you know, uh, upon what I say without, without actually hearing everything I say. So read my blogs, read my blog, blog posts, and check out my, my other teachings about this subject. And once again, thanks again for listening. God bless you. Give you great revelation into all these things that we're talking about and give you a great yearning and desire for him so that you would seek him more, so that you would pray more, so you would read his scriptures more and learn more about God. And God will answer those prayers in wonderful ways. In the name of Yeshua, thanks again.